Australian is Jacob Lang, uh, as she mentioned, my five minutes with Dr. Switch Targets. And today I'd like to share with you some of the archival research that I had the opportunity to do while I was studying abroad last semester in Cambridge. So you may be familiar with some of the pivotal battles in the Second World War, such as the invasion of Normandy, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of Iwo Jima. Our study of military history tends to focus in on those who dealt the killing blow in the war, but at the cost of overlooking those who set them up with the opportunity to do so. In this instance, the British fleet in the Mediterranean in the Second World War, particularly before the American intervention in 1942. So I looked further into this topic using the uh, Churchill College Archive Center at the University of Cambridge. Here are my archival sources that I use, which are these numbers as a collection that could contain anywhere from 12 documents to several hundred. <clears throat> and in these documents, I was looking primarily at written correspondence such as this. Uh, this is a letter written by the Commander-in-Chief of the Mediterranean, uh, the, com the Commander-in-Chief of the British Mediterranean Fleet, uh, Sir Admiral Sir Andrew Brown Cunningham. You can see his signature here. This is the actual handwritten letter that he sent during World War II, the actual physical copy that I was reading. Uh, and in these letters, I was looking for how he understood the role of the British Mediterranean fleet, and also the effect that his success had on the greater scheme of the war. And I came to the conclusion that the role of the British Mediterranean fleet was to deny control of the seas to Axis, and thereby cut off the supplies between Italy and North Africa, where um, Italian and German forces were located. Uh, during this study, I employed the ladder of military activity, which is a tool used in the study of military research that contains uh, first policy, which is the general goals of a country or a nation, followed by grand strategy, which is the employment of all military, social, and economic factors in the pursuit of these goals. Uh, thirdly, we have strategy, which is the planning of the use of military force, followed by operations, which is the use of battle and achieve, uh, sorry, and achieving strategic goals. And lastly, tactics, which is the conduct of the individual soldier or sailor in this instance uh, in the, over the course of a battle. So now that we've introduced our methodology, let's introduce our protagonist. This is Admiral Sir Andrew Brown Cunningham, the Commander-in-Chief of the British Mediterranean Fleet, the greatest sailor since Nelson, according to his contemporary General Sir R. N. O'Connor. Nelson is referring to Admiral Horatio Nelson, legendary British heroes of the Napoleonic Wars. He was the commander of the British Mediterranean Fleet from 1939 to 1943, when he was promoted to First Sea Lord, the highest ranking position within the British Navy, and the Chief of the Naval Staff. He garnered respect from all of his contemporaries, for examples like David Eisenhower, labeled him as one of the finest individuals that I have ever met. Pretty good endorsement, if I say so myself. Um, so now that we uh, understand the commander of the British fleet, let's move on to the historical background that surrounded him in his time uh, in the Navy theater. So the Second World War began in September of 1939 with the Anglo-French declaration of war on Germany. However, the war did not come into the Mediterranean until June of 1940. And the reason for this is that Germany originally had no forces within the Mediterranean. Instead, the British and the French had to be concerned with Italy and their bid for the creation of a Mediterranean empire. Over the past several years, Italy had been aggressively expanding into territories such as Ethiopia, um, Somalia, Eritrea, which are all located right here off the map, unfortunately, and Libya, which is located right here. The, the primary concern of the British and the French was the bomber, the Air Force of the, the Regia Aeronautica, the Air Force of the Italian Empire, as well as the 105 submarines that they possessed patrolling the Mediterranean. However, realistically, the Italians were totally unprepared for a modern conflict, both economically and militarily. So the British and the French, in planning for this war, decided to split the Mediterranean in half. The British would cover the eastern half of the Mediterranean from their base here at Alexandria. They had abandoned their pre-war position of Malta because the Air Force and the Army determined that it was strategically impossible to hold on to due to the um, possibility of Italian airstrikes. In conjunction with this, the French would cover the western half of the Mediterranean from their ports here at Oran and here at Toulon. Um, and finally, the purpose of maintaining a British fleet in the Mediterranean was under doubt at the beginning of the war, let's say. The British combined chief of staff briefly considered removing the fleet entirely in order to support the war in the Atlantic. However, Cunningham successfully argued that the uh, Mediterranean fleet was necessary for grand strategic reasons that overshadowed the strategic and operational reasons that the Navy wished to remove the fleet. He argued that it was necessary to maintain the integrity of the economic blockade of Axis Europe, as well as to support British forces in uh, Egypt here and the Middle East here. You can see here a document that I found within the Churchill College archives. It's a map 
and written out that de details the deployment of forces in June of 1940 as at the beginning of the Italian or the, at the beginning of the Italian War. So the uh, Allies are in blue, the Axis are in red. So here we have Alexandria, uh, Toulon, Oran, and Malta. And here's the main Italian naval base of Toronto, right in the heel of the boot of Italy. So moving on, Italy, uh, sorry, war finally came to the Mediterranean theater on June 10th of 1940. And Cunningham immediately took action to take control of the sea. As I previously mentioned, his goal was to control the Mediterranean Sea. And he immediately pushed his fleet aggressively out of Alexandria here into the central Mediterranean basin. <coughs> the Italians failed to respond, however, and he returned without any serious action. Then came his first opportunity to, true, opportunity to truly show the dominance of the British fleet in the Mediterranean, and this was the capitulation of the French. France surrendered to Germany in June of 1940, and suddenly their fleet was no longer a strategic asset for the British, it was a strategic liability, a threat that had to be destroyed. And they had to do this with violence or through peaceful means. Luckily, Cunningham was able to peacefully negotiate with his counterpart in Alexandria for the disarmament of the fleet, but Admiral Somerville, who was based in Gibraltar here with Force H, was unable to do so and had to open fire on the French fleet in Oran, killing approximately 1,300 Frenchmen. The first action between the Italian and British fleets came at the action off of Calabria, in which the British firmly established a naval supremacy over the Italians that they would maintain for the majority of the war. I will come back to that later. And finally, in November, specifically on the night of November 11th, the uh, 20 swordfish torpedo bombers from the newly arrived aircraft carrier HMS Illustrious launched an attack on the main Italian naval base at Toronto, as I previously mentioned, sinking three of the six Italian battleships present. Two of them would be repaired within six months, the last would never be seen with yet again. This firmly established the importance of air power in the Mediterranean and in the greater scheme of the war in general, as well as fur uh, further establishing the superiority of the British fleet. Now, I said I would come back to the action off of Calabria, and here it is. We have another map from the archives, and you can hear the British are in red and the Italians are in blue. Here you have the uh, British flagship war spike right here, launching an attack, hitting the Italian flagship Julius Cesare here and forcing it to retreat under the cover of smoke. Now, articles such as this found in the archives that allowed me to see how the tactical acumen of Cunningham within the course of battle allowed him to achieve his strategic goals in the grander scheme of the Mediterranean theater. So at the turn of the year, the British were in a far stronger position than they had been when the war had begun. <clears throat> they had effectively established complete naval supremacy over the Italians. The Italians al almost never left port at, the, at this point in the war. Malta, which had been, which had boasted a grand total of three fighters at the beginning of the war as its entire military force, had been significantly strengthened. And Italian offensives in Greece and Egypt had both stalled, and the uh, it, British forces in Egypt had counterattacked into the Western Desert, gaining significant territory. However, this success papered over the fact that Cunningham, superb leadership in the incompetence of the Italian military forces was overriding the fact that the British were operating on far too few resources for, for what was being demanded of them. Should they be faced with a more aggressive and able enemy, they would face serious consequences. Enter Germany. Germany entered the war in January of 1942, the war in the Mediterranean, in 1941, I apologize. They entered the war in January of 1941. By, they looked south and realized that their southern border was suddenly incredibly vulnerable to attack because Italy was really bad at its job. <laughs> So they immediately began transforming troop formations from Europe into this theater, such as Fliegerkorps or Flying Corps 10 from Norway into Sicily, and Roman Rommel's Acre Corps into Libya. They also committed units to the support of Mussolini's drive into Greece. And these units came with overwhelming air superiority, which would allow them to achieve incredible success over the coming months. In Greece, at the beginning of March, there was 200 German and Italian fighters. There was 30 British planes. And in the Western Desert, there were no British planes and a significant amount of German fighters. So on January 10th, HMS Illustrious, which had been so successful the previous year, was critically damaged after being attacked by the German Air Force and was forced to uh, go to Seattle, actually, for repairs. And by the middle of April, all of the British gains in Egypt would have been reversed and the entirety of Greece would be conquered. However, the German air supremacy would be matched with maintained British naval supremacy. At the Battle of Matapan on March 28th, the British managed to sink three Italian cruisers and two destroyers, as well as damaging a further two destroyers. And because the Germans could not pull any naval resources into this theater 
the burden for the naval operations still fell entirely on the Italians. They were unable to achieve this goal. And therefore, this set the stage for a conflict between the naval superiority of the British and the air superiority of the Germans. And this would be realized in the debacle at Crete. So the Germans decided to invade Crete because they saw it as a very useful strategic target for threatening British interests in North Africa. They, this attack would be carried out by paratroopers because the British ringed this entire island with their fleet, and there was no way the Germans could get through by sea. At this point in the war, Hitler had transferred three fleeter corps into the Mediterranean, a force totaling over 700 aircraft, a significant portion of their air power at the time. So they landed and were able to wrest control from the British forces garrisoning the island. However, the German forces also suffered significant casualties attempting to cross from Greece, which is across from here, from Greece into Crete because of Cunningham's patrolling cruisers and destroyers. Cunningham was able to save the majority of his garrison with his fleet, but suffered heavy casualties in doing so, including damage to the formidable the carrier that had to replace the illustrious, and damage to his flagship, the war spy. Now, one of the principal reasons that Greece, Greece fell, I'm sorry, Crete fell was because of the inter service rivalries between the RAF and the Royal Navy. Uh, Coastal Command, which was the RAF division that operated overseas, uh, was independent of the Royal Navy. They were a branch of the uh, RAF, and therefore Cunningham had no nominal authority over them. But this was a problem for Cunningham, as it uh, forced him to, or it didn't allow him, I should say, it didn't allow him to make the best tactical or operational or strategic use of the fighters at his disposal, and therefore after a barrage of letters between him and his superiors in London, uh, Mediterranean, sorry, Coastal Command Group 201, which operated in the Mediterranean, was changed to Coastal Command 201 Naval Cooperation Group in September of 1941. Now in 1942, the Germans continued their period of dominance, but luckily for the British, they didn't have to hold out for much longer. All they had to do was fight a holding action because the Americans had entered the war. So Cunningham was reassigned to the position of the naval liaison to Washington, D.C. on April 1st of 1942, and would participate in the planning of Operations Torch and uh, Hussle, which were the invasions of North Africa and Sicily. And he would return to the Mediterranean with the Americans in September of 1942, and would eventually conquer the entire region. So, what can we conclude from these? A, air power is absolutely essential to victory in the Second World War. Naval and land power are both important, but without air power, you cannot control the movements of your enemies. And secondly, we have Cunningham's success turned Italy from a strategic asset for the Germans into a strategic liability. Germany was a use, or sorry, Italy was a useful ally for Germany both militarily and economically until they were forced to cover for them essentially and divert critical resources from fronts such as the Eastern Front into uh, the Mediterranean Sea, a place where they didn't want to be at all. They had no pending interest in the Mediterranean Sea, but were forced to divert resources there because of the Italian's failure and Cunningham's leadership. And finally, it provided the uh, Allies the opportunity to establish a foothold in Europe through Italy and Sicily, which allowed them to open a southern front against Germany and establish uh, air bases in places such as Crete and Greece, which could bomb German oil production facilities in southern Germany and Romania. So with that, I would like to take your questions. Oh, and this is the Churchill College Archive Center, in case you were curious. <laughs> So primary research, uh, I didn't, most of the primary research that I was doing has already been tapped by British naval historians such as uh, Captain Stephen Roskill, who's the official British naval historian of the war. And a lot of books that I was reading were using the same primary sources that I was using. I was recognizing quotes that I used in my paper in these books and uh, source material that I was using. But the one thing that I found that was different about my paper from uh, most of the uh, secondary sources was the application of the uh, naval fleet in the Mediterranean to the grander scheme of the war. So the use of the naval fleet in destroying the deployment of, or in disrupting the deployment of forces from Italy to North, to North Africa. Because in a lot of secondary sources we see battles in North Africa talked about quite frequently, but we don't talk about how the forces got there and what the effect of Cunningham's force was. So primary research wise, there wasn't, it wasn't um, unique, but the application of it was Anything else? Um, I was just uh, wondering, 
that was a very fascinating survey. So I was wondering um, if your research, um, in, in your research, you made any conclusions about the importance of a Mediterranean theater like today, or if you were learning from primary sources from, were you more looking for new ways that, um, I don't know, the primary sources talked about um, the strategies that were happening during World War II versus the secondary sources that were translated in slightly different ways? Um, I, yeah, I was mostly focusing on the effects on the greater scheme of the Second World War. Unfortunately, I didn't really get into the uh, strategy of the Mediterranean today, but I'm sure it does have applications there. Anything else?